Uh, all righty. So, interesting few days. I hope you all stayed warm. Um, we appear to be missing our pen, so finger it is. Where Looking at 6.1 volumes of solids of revolution. So I mentioned that I've sort of excised bits of chapter six from the course, just because this material is so artificial, but I, it's not totally useless. And I want to do at least one section. I mean, the main advantage of this section is not that you will be finding volumes of solids of revolution in the real world. It's that it shows how integrals can kind of show up in the problems that do not, on the face of them, have anything to do with integrals. And the question is this. Suppose you have a solid sort of symmetric and rounded, sort of like a face shape. And you wanted to find the um the volume of this solid. The way we're going to think about this solid and the, um, where the phrase solid of revolution comes from Suppose we have, let me copy this down as far as possible. Suppose we have a curve and a horizontal line. For now, we'll assume it's horizontal. For now, we'll assume the curve is just strictly above the line and not touching the line. And suppose we thought of this curve and this line as being physical objects. So we're now imagining that this curve is lying on the whiteboard and we could grab it and move it around. Maybe a stiff piece of wire lying on the whiteboard. Well, let's take this curve and let's physically attach it to that line so that the curve can no longer move around because it's now attached to the line. That's uh, And let's now add a joint here and a joint here. So we can no longer take this curve and pull it north or pull it east or pull it west, but because of these joints, we can move it into three-dimensional space. It rotates like a door. Well, if you took this curve and rotated it, 300, and 60 degrees, you would trace out a shape in three-dimensional space. And making allowances, as always, for my artistic skills, the shape 
we traced out in three-dimensional space would be this vase whose volume we were interested in. So when we form a shape in this way, taking a curve and rotating it through three-dimensional space and looking at the region that curve traces out, it's called either a surface, or a solid of revolution. And I mean, those words, it's sort of, the, do you want to think of this vase as being empty? Then you call it a surface. Do you want to think of it as being a solid object? Then you call it a solid, but it's not going to matter in this class, whether it's empty or not, and we'll use surface of revolution and solid of revolution as interchangeable phrases. And we then ask the question, how do we find the volume. And calculus, both integral and differential calculus, and the sequences and series stuff that we'll get to later in this course, calculus has a process to it. And I don't know if I've written the process down explicitly, but it's this. First, we ask, can we approximate what we want? So in this case, can we, can we, uh, sorry, uh, being hassled by windows. So in this case, can we approximate the volume we're looking for? And then, can we make the approximation exact with a limit. I mean, that's how we defined derivatives. We used average rates of change as an approximation, then we turned them into the derivative by taking a limit as h goes to zero. And it's how we defined integrals. We approximated the area under a curve using the rectangles, and then we took a limit as the width of the rectangles all went to zero. So if the answer to both of these questions is yes, you probably have some kind of calculus problem on your hand. And it might be funny one day to get halfway through a lecture and then answer one of these rhetorical questions by saying, no, there's nothing we can do, let's move on, but that's not going to be today. So we can think of, we're taking this entire curve and rotating it 360 degrees. We can think of that 
just like we did with Riemann sums, we can think of breaking this curve up into pieces. And we can just take one of these pieces, let's say the last piece. and rotate it 360 degrees. And if we do that, we get a shape kind of like this. And we could do that with each of those little pieces and we'd get a bunch of shapes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we'd get eight of them. And if we could find the volumes of all of these shapes, we could take those volumes and add them up and get the volume that we're looking for. Well, in reality, we don't know how to find the volume of this shape I have drawn here any more than we knew how to find the volume of this. But we can approximate it. And as you might expect in the integral calculus course, this approximation is going to be sort of reminiscent of the Riemann sum stuff we did. in that we're going to draw a rectangle here. Now, if we took that rectangle and we rotated it around the line we're looking at, we would generate a cylinder, kind of like that. And the thing about cylinders is that we know how to find the volume of a cylinder. It's the area of a circle, pi times the radius squared times the height of the cylinder. And of course, the volume of the cylinder isn't quite the volume that we're looking at. But, you know, if you compare the volume of the cylinder to the volume that we actually want, you know, you don't quite have it. You're missing some stuff that you want up here and down here. And You've got some stuff that you don't want up here and down here. But it's not a bad looking approximation. I mean, the majority of this stuff is in common. I mean, you can shade the stuff we have that we don't want, and you can shade the stuff we don't have that we do want. But if we shade the stuff that we both do have and do want, it's this whole region here. It's a pretty good chunk. So this is our idea for an approximation. Um, draw these rectangles, rotate the rectangles. When we rotate a rectangle, we get a cylinder. We can find the volume of a cylinder. So we can approximate this. Repeat it with all eight of the rectangles. We get eight approximations. Add our eight approximations up. We get an approximation of the volume. 
And then just as happened with Riemann sums, if you let these rectangles we're using all get thinner and thinner, the approximation will get better and better. So we can take a limit just as we did with the Riemann sums and the limit will turn our approximation exact. So that's the overview of what we're doing. And I mean, I call it an overview, but it's a pretty good summary. Let's just try to figure out what form do though we get from this. We've got our axis. And we've got our curve. And we've cut the curve into rectangles. Let's just look at one rectangle. Or rather, we cut the axis into intervals, and we use the intervals to create a rectangle. And the technical way we did that was to take a point in the curve. and draw a line up to the curve and use that to create the rectangle like so. And we'll take this rectangle and we'll rotate it around Let's assume, just for a moment at least, that this is the x-axis. Keep this simple. We'll rotate the curve around the x-axis, and we'll get some volume approximation. And let's see what volume approximation we get. Just as with um, the Riemann sum area stuff, let's assume that all of the intervals we're going to look at are equally wide, and we'll call that width delta x. Well, And yes, yes, that, that's, that's correct. And this height is going to be F of X sub I star. And we're going to get I F of X squared Delta X, I think. Something's weird with the picture I drew, but it is pi the radius squared. Uh, so this is going to give us the right thing. I'm not going to try to diagnose what I think's weird here. I'm just going to go on. And, um, we do this a bunch of times and we get a bunch of approximations that look like this and we add them all up and we get pi times f of x, now f of x sub i star squared delta x. 
And this is a Riemann sum. So we take it and No, I, I just drew the picture a little weird. This is absolutely correct. We're going to get a cylinder. It's going to go down here. This f of x sub i star is half of this distance, so it's the radius. This delta x is the height, i times the radius squared. I just, something about the way I drew that picture through me, but everything is as it should be. So we repeat that process. Um, we get, I mean, we have however many rectangles we have added together. And then we've said, well, the more rectangles we have and the thinner they get, the better this approximation will become. So if we make our approximation better by using more rectangles, then to make our approximation the best, to make it stop being an approximation and just to be the right answer, we should take the limit as n goes to infinity. And we are about to need some limits of integration. We'll say that we are going from A to B. The limit as n goes to infinity of a Riemann sum is an integral. You turn the sum into an integral sign. And whatever the terms of the Riemann sum are, go here, except your x sub i stars turn just to x's, and your delta x turns into dx. And we're integrating from a to b. And uh, here, let me try, let me rewrite that b so it's not over the integral sign. So there's the formula, or a formula, and I'll write down some stuff on the next frame, kind of to summarize. Um, this is a side note, by the way, but you see when we take the limit, that sum turns into an integral. A lot of mathematical notation seems essentially random. But the integral sign comes from taking the capital S in the word sum and stretching it a little. So, given a curve above the x-axis I mean a curve given by a function so a function f of x above the x-axis the solid or surface of revolution formed by rotating the 
the curve about the axis has volume V equals the integral from A to B. I didn't write the A and the B down, but I hope we're used to this by now. A curve f of x on an interval from A to B. So it has the volume of the integral from A to B of pi times f of x squared dx. And because volumes can be pulled out of integrals, what you often see is that pi sitting outside the integral and the f of x squared, of course, cannot be pulled out. So sitting there inside the integral. And this f of x, is our radius. Let's go back to this. And of course, I was thinking it was weird. I drew it sideways, is what I'm now seeing. When we take the cylinder and we rotate it, or rather, when we take the rectangle and we rotate it, we get a cylinder. And this f of x is the radius of the cylinder. And I want to emphasize that because when we want to look at, well, what happens if we rotate it around something other than the x-axis? Remembering that that f of x is the radius is going to help us a lot. Let me... I am not a textbook. I will write my example a little compactly, but I hope it's clear. We're taking the curve one over x on some interval, the interval from one to two, and we're rotating it around the x-axis. Um, before we go into examples or this example, does anybody have any questions about what we've done so far. Then this example is, I mean, all of these problems are going to be some mixture of bug and play, but then you have to take an integral, and taking the integral can be easy, or it can be difficult, or it can be somewhere in between. I guess for our purposes, what the curve looks like does it really matter, except that we do need a positive curve, a curve strictly above the x-axis. You might, uh, and that might be evident to you, but if not, we can 
take a quick look and verify that this curve is doing what we need it to do for the formula to work, which is just that it's positive. So we'll take this region and we'll rotate it around the x-axis. The radius we call one over x. Um, and it's sort of plug and play, at least up until to the point where we have to find an integral, the integral from one to two multiplied by pi of this function, one over x squared dx. I don't know. <laughs> what I thought I was doing there. This is the integral, and it's what we need to figure out to, uh, to find the volume that we're looking for. So this is a good example they always say that, you know, there are no one-size-fits-all techniques. I mean, up to a point, what we have here looks like U substitution. We do have a composition. We have that 1 over x inside of the square function. But we don't have anything that could be D U here. If we tried that in U be 1 over x, du would be negative one over x squared, and we don't have any of that. So this is a matter of doing a little simplification and then rewriting the thing. So one over x squared is one, over x squared. I mean, properly speaking, it's one squared over x squared, but of course one squared is one. And this we can find the antiderivative of, at least I hope we can. Somebody, either give me this antiderivative or give me a step we could take to make finding the antiderivative easier. Can you write it as x to the negative two? That is an excellent idea. And then it's just easy after that, right? And then it's easy, or at least depending on where people are and how much experience they have, but relatively easy, let's say. If you bump the negative two up, it becomes negative one. You divide by the new power, uh, one over negative one. Let's just rewrite that as a negative sign. And we're evaluating from a one to two. So let me, because it would be easy just to make some little mistake here. This is negative one over x squared. It would be easy to make a little mistake, he says, and then makes a little mistake. So this is negative one over x from one to two. 
In particular, we want to be careful with our negative signs and our subtraction. We plug two in, we get negative one half, okay? Minus a negative is going to be plus one over one. That pi is just sitting there. So negative one half plus one is positive one half. I make this one half pi. Seem right to everyone? And one half pi, I mean, I guess the traditional thing to do would just be to leave it like that when you have a pi. Or, I mean, if this were a word problem and like you're actually trying to fill a solid and you can't order one half pi of something, you might want to get a decimal approximation. But it all depends on the situation at hand. Let's take this and let's complicate this. Let's ask, what if instead of the x -axis, we have some other horizontal axis. And but for now, let's keep with the assumption that the horizontal axis is below the curve. That's not the necessary assumption. It's just an assumption we're making for now to keep these problems sort of in check and only introduce one complication at a time. Let's, we can keep one over X. We can keep the interval from one to two. But let's ditch the x-axis. Let's say we're rotating this around y equals negative 3. And let's ask ourselves, well, how does that change the problem? So remember, we've got the radius. And in these problems, the radius is the distance from the curve to the axis of rotation. So it's going to be the integral from A to B, I, the radius squared dx, that's not going to change. It's just that now we've got this one over x, this axis. And then below the x-axis, in particular at negative 3, We've got the curve we're rotating it around. And we need the radius. So what's this going to be? You can't just add three to the original. That's exactly correct. Thank you. This distance here 
is one over x. This distance here is three. So as far as the radius, it's one over x plus three. Um, sadly, this is going to complicate the integral pretty, pretty significantly. But let's see if we can figure this out in the time we have left. So A is still one, B is still two. Still got this pi there. The radius is now one over x plus three squared. The radius is being squared. So we've got composition, but, but there's no hope of using u substitution here. We, if we let u be one over x plus three, again, du would be negative one over x squared, and we don't have anything that looks like that. The, so, not you substitution. Does anybody have any thoughts about what we could do? Now it's not very exciting or glamorous how we're going to tackle this is we're going to foil that out, and then we'll have a bunch of terms whose integrals we can make. Um, so we'll have one over x times one over x. That's going to give us one over x squared, one over x times three, and another one over x times three. So six over x and three times three is nine. And I guess, I mean, I said it complicated things significantly. I guess this isn't, let's say it complicates things by a medium amount. We've still got this x to the negative two. We've, I won't re, well, Maybe I'll rewrite this ever so slightly just to emphasize that what we really have here is a one over x. So it will turn into the natural log when we integrate. Getting ahead of myself, nine dx. x to the negative two, deal with it the same way we did the last time. So because we have addition, let me say this explicitly, because we have addition, we're just dealing with these piece by piece. We're integrating the first thing, we're integrating the second thing, we're integrating the third thing. So when you take an integral, a uh, constant like that six is just going to sit there. The integral of one over x is the natural log. The integral of nine is nine x. 
We're going from one to two. And then I don't think we're going to have time to get the calculator loaded, but um, th this isn't something you can do in your head because the natural log of two is going to just be some messy number. But you know, what we're doing here is what we always do. We stick the two in. Plus six ln two. Uh, the absolute value of two is two, so I haven't bothered writing the absolute value symbol. Nine times two is 18 minus. And now we stick one in here. And if we type that into the calculator, we'd get whatever we get. So this is a pretty lengthy section. It's actually that this, this textbook has two different sections on volumes and they're both kind of lengthy. One of the cuts I made was that that was probably too much volume. We'll just do 6.1 and we will finish it tomorrow. I will see you then. Mm -hmm. I hope you all had 